I'm very happy to see so many people here in the room already socializing and talking. And I know we have even more online, so thank you all for joining us in the Indian Treaty Room. I'm Kei Koizumi, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Principal Deputy Director for Science, Society, and Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. We are here today to talk about America's investment in research and development. We're also here today to host the National Science Board as they release the 2024 Science and Engineering Indicators Report. For a lot of my career, I've been a major user of and contributor to these reports and the other high quality products of the board and the National Science Foundation's National Center for Science Engineering Statistics, or NCSES. So this is a particularly great day for me. Today, first we will hear from Arthi Prabhakar, our assistant to the president for science and technology and the director of OSTP. Next, we will hear from Dan Reed, chair of the National Science Board, who will present key findings from the 2024 Science and Engineering Indicators Report. Then we will hear from Nani Coloretti, the deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, about the president's fiscal year 2025 budget that was just released on Monday. Nani will be joining us in this room as soon as she's able because it is budget week and she's been having a busy week. Finally, Panch uh, Sathuraman Panch Panchanathan, <laughs> director of the National Science Foundation, will discuss NSF's priorities and plans given the indicators report and the 2025 budget. We will then have some time for questions from our in-person audience. So you have fair warning to prepare your questions. Now I'd like to present Arthi Prabhakar, director of OSTP and a member of the president's cabinet as of this administration. Arthi. Thanks, Kay. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you. Welcome to the White House. If you peek through, you, you get the best view here. It's terrific. Uh, and I know we're live streaming, so welcome to the folks who are uh, online as well. Um, as Kay said, today we uh, are happy to host the National Science Board as they're releasing science and engineering indicators. We're also, it happens to have landed the same week that the President's 25 budget has come out. And so we'll also touch on uh, what that means for R&D with uh, a continuing strong commitment there. But I want to start with the science and engineering indicators report. And the first thing I want to do is to thank NSB and to thank the science and engineering indicators team uh, for doing this critically important work. Uh, these reports are the data, they are the foundation that we rely on to understand how America and the world are progressing on R&D. I, 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 thought, I, I thought, gee, I'll say, I, used, I have used science and engineering indicators since you know, 19 whatever, but I literally couldn't remember a time that I wasn't using science and engineering indicators. I feel like I learned about it in kindergarten and never, never let go of it. Um, <laughs> So it is really integral to the business that we are all in. Uh, this report um, that's coming out today shows uh, the tremendous strength of American research and development. And it also points to the work that we still have ahead of us. And you'll hear several of the key points from that from Dan Reed in a few minutes. What I want to do is highlight the top line numbers uh, for US R&D in 2021, which is the most recent data in this report. One of the important indicators uh, is the percentage that our, uh, of GDP that our country spends on R&D. This is public and private spending together. And uh, those of you who uh, remember, in 2009, President Obama set a goal that seemed very aggressive at that time, and that goal was to achieve 3% of GDP uh, spending on R&D. Well, we've now blown past that goal. In this report, you'll find that we're now at 3.5% of GDP that this country is putting into R&D. That is the highest percentage America has ever spent on R&D. Uh, and of course, because we continue to have the world's largest GDP, what that means is that our total dollar value of spending in R&D is also uh, the largest ever for our country, but also the largest in the world still. And that number in 2021 from this report is $806 billion. Now, these are these critical investments. This, these investments are the reason that we have here in America 
uh, the greatest engine for innovation and progress uh, that the world has ever seen. And it, it, it doesn't happen without these resources. Uh, what you find when you look at this report is that the huge surge that has come in that uh, increase in spending, but also the increase as a percentage of GDP. It came from businesses. And what you see in these numbers is the intensification of our innovation economy. Most of that industry R&D growth came from information technology industries, some as well from pharmaceuticals. But these are the industries that are, that are massively driving this increase in R&D. These are investments that companies choose to make because they see the promise in new science and technology. They see the potential for new products, for new services, for revenues, and for profits. And most of these innovation-intensive industries, of course, grew out of prior federal R&D investments. And even today, they continue to draw on the vital uh, for the work that they do. And you know, if you think about that, that is true in fields that are as diverse as artificial intelligence and new medicines and clean energy. So I think it's a very consistent theme. You'll hear more about science and engineering indicators in a few minutes. Uh, the, mo the numbers I've been talking about are from 2021. Uh, but in that year and every year since, President Biden has made federal R&D a priority in his administration. And if you have heard the president talk about almost any topic, one thing you probably have heard the president President do is talk about how America is a country that can be defined in a single word, and that word is possibilities. In every interaction I've ever had with him, it's completely clear that he sees science and technology and R&D as one of the most powerful forces for creating American possibilities. And that is why, when you look at his budget, President Biden continues to stand up for federal R&D. The 2025 budget request totals $200 billion for R&D. And the way I think about this is, of course, we understand that companies invest in R&D for their future. These are federal R&D investments that represent our country investing in the nation's future. Because this is research and development, both research and development, for public purposes that range from national security to health. The environment. And as I think this room knows very well, these R&D investments, because of those public missions, they come from the Department of Defense, from Health and Human Services and from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, from the Department of Transportation, from NOAA, and from EPA, and more. It's a very long list. Federal R&D is also the research and the infrastructure, the education, the standards that underpin all of these public missions, but also provide a foundation for that private sector uh, R&D activity, which has to flourish as well. And this part of R&D, this sort of basic foundational infrastructure, is part of the R&D in each of the agencies that I just mentioned, but it's also part of the, it's also represented in the important foundation that the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Standards and Technology provide. So these are all the elements that together make up the president's budget for R&D in 2025, again, totaling $200 billion. I'll just finish my brief remarks by saying that last week at his State of the Union address, at the end, the president called on all of us to build the future together. And it's hard to think of a more exciting invitation than that. And this is really what all of us who do R&D get to do every single day. R&D is how we open the doors so that the future can be better than the past. It's how we overcome the limitations of today and, and step into a better tomorrow. This report and the president's budget both remind us of the tremendous strengths that we have here in America with our R&D capabilities, and they both also start us uh, on this important path to the work ahead. So with that, let me hand it over to Dan Reed to talk about um, what the National Science Board is releasing today. So I trust you all grabbed one of these on the way in. If you haven't, there are copies outside. Those of you who are online, uh, you can also find them online. There is a wealth of data, far more than I'm going to talk about today uh, in the report. 
So um, thank you, Arthi, for that uh, inspiring introduction. As she said, I'm Dan Reed. I'm chair of the National Science Board, and I'm delighted to be here today to represent the board uh, to fulfill an important legislative function. Congress charges the board to, quote, render to the president and the Congress a report on indicators of the state of science and engineering in the United States, unquote. So it's an honor to share our report's findings with the administration, uh, with the Congress, with academic and industry leaders, and with members of the public. Indicators, as Arthi noted, is prepared by the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, or NCSES, under the guidance of the National Science Board. It's the board's flagship product. It's policy neutral, gold standard data, reliably and rigorously analyzed. Uh, and as she said, every time I talk to people in this town, they reference this data constantly because it is a very detailed and accurate description of the state of our SNRE enterprise. But I have to begin by thanking uh, Imelda Rivers and Christine Fryman um, of, uh, of the center uh, because this was prepared under their guidance um, and support along with my colleague Maureen Kondik who chaired the board's committee uh, that helped produce the report. So a big thank you to NCSES leadership and staff, as well as Maureen, uh, for getting us to this point. The report, uh, given the rigor I mentioned, is roughly two years in the making. That's why we do it every other year. Uh, so what does it actually say? I sort of led the prelude. Uh, well, let me tell you some facts. And there's a lot more data in the report. First, as Arthi mentioned, the U.S. performs more total research and development, or R&D, than any other country. Second, it also conducts the largest amount of basic research. That's the blue sky stuff that asks questions and creates the future out of whole cloth. As Arthi also noted, there's been a substantial increase in business funding for R&D and the CHIPS and Science Act investments are also a cause for celebration in that space. But the future, the undiscovered country, is infinite, uh, and we've only begun to meet the moment of opportunity. As the indicators data also show, the nation's global position is being challenged as countries in East and Southeast Asia, particularly China, uh, invest in their own innovation and discovery. Now, a bit of housekeeping. Some of fast-moving topics are not fully covered in this report, and that's because the indicators reports are necessarily retrospective. That's how you get hard, rigorous data. Uh, they're necessarily lagging. So there are a few things that are happening quickly that you may not see, and those, for example, don't fully reflect the impact of chips and science legislation yet. So just know that as we talk about the data. So let me turn uh, in a bit more detail to what the data says in discovery. The U.S. remains the largest performer of R&D with $806 billion in gross domestic expenditures in 2021. Uh, China at $668 billion is next. In the U.S., the overall trend for federally funded R&D is roughly flat, though there were substantial increases between 2011 and 2021. However, and this goes back to what Arthi said, private sector R&D funding surpassed federal investments in the 1980s, and it has continued to accelerate, if you look at the charts uh, and the report, due to business R&D expenditures from several high-tech uh, business sectors. The report also shows that businesses fund almost as much basic research excuse me, as the federal government. We often think of businesses doing R and D with a little bit of R and a big D. There is a lot of big R going on in business today as well. So what about translating these discoveries into industry and societal impact? With a lot of metrics in the report, but I'm gonna talk about just two today, publications and patents. On publications, Although China is now the top overall producer of science and engineering articles, the U.S. has the greater share of the most highly cited publications. With the proviso that China's growth in high impact articles is also outpacing its overall growth, so that delta is shrinking. 
Let me turn to an area that is all over this town and all over the country, artificial intelligence, right? It's the meme of the day. So what about publications in areas of, of uh, such as AI? Well, the data shows that from 2003 to 2022 that the U.S. and China are the two largest publishers of AI research. And researchers from China authored approximately double the number of AI-related articles as researchers in the U.S. However, collaborative research between the U.S. and China resulted in the largest number of co-authored articles of any country pair. It speaks to international collaboration. Turning to international patents, China is the top overall producer of international patents, and it recently surpassed the U.S. So what enables discovery and innovation? We all know the answer to this. It's people. It's educated talent. Those are the transformative forces that drive our future and on which the U.S. R&D enterprise rests. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit now from presenting data from the indicator's report uh, and its policy neutral summaries to sharing a few of the board's priority foci that have come out of the Vision 2030 strategy document that we produced in collaboration with NSF. And I'm going to talk a lot about talent development. So a couple of recommendations, and I think Director Panchanathan will probably amplify what I'm going to say about this. Uh, first, we believe we must increase the flow of domestic talent into the STEM workforce. And second and related, we must continue to attract and retain STEM talent from around the world. Why? The STEM workforce is now one quarter of the total U.S. workforce. One quarter. That's 37 million people. And this includes about 18 million workers with at least a bachelor's degree who use STEM skills every day, but an even larger number, 19 million, without a bachelor's degree. These are what we call the skill technical workforce. And there's a shortage of both. And with the demand for high paying STEM jobs projected to continue to grow as we accelerate our R&D investment in the future, we have to meet that shortfall. And to do that, we've increasingly relied on foreign born workers, especially in fields underlying critical and emerging technologies. Today, over half of U.S. scientists and engineers and mathematical scientists, that would be me, uh, at the doctoral level are foreign born. I'm proud to be a native born American, I should say. But the U.S. has long been a global magnet for talent. That's been one of our superpowers, that the best and the brightest on the planet want to study and work here. We have to preserve that. But it's not a given. They come because they see opportunities. We have to continue to create those opportunities. And to be sure, our outsized dependent on uh, that source of talent, particularly from China, is a potential geopolitical risk. We have to acknowledge that. But looking domestically, there were also opportunities and cause for concern. COVID-era pandemic declines in K-12 mass scores are alarming, and this data is also in the indicator's report. Those declines are the largest for individuals from race and ethnicity groups that are already marginalized in STEM, and those for lower socioeconomic status. And the gap between low scores and high scores is now greater than it's been since we started tracking this data in 1978. We have to do something about this in this country because we're depriving students of opportunity. So we see a really urgent need to address these missing millions, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it is necessary to build the robust STEM workforce we need as a country to remain a global leader. So what, what might we do about that? First, and I think everyone in this room will likely agree, we have to improve access to higher education if students are to pursue advanced STEM degrees. Uh, and we, there are many aspects of that, but we have to, get to be diligent and continue to pursue that. Second, as I said, we must continue to welcome international students from around the globe and to implement policies that entice and enable them to stay and work here after they receive their degrees. 
And this includes not only the traditional sources, but also students from low and middle income countries that are building their R&D enterprise and they're poised to become our global collaborators. So how we broaden that base. Indicators data shows, and this is really great news, that the U.S. is the top destination for internationally mobile students. And the downturn that we saw in the COVID pandemic is rebounded, and we have more international students now uh, at levels that exceed those before the pandemic. But we have to ensure that remains true. Finally, there's an enormous need and a great opportunity to expand the skilled technical workforce, or STW. As I said, these are the STEM workers without bachelor's degrees. And here's a factoid to sort of put this in perspective. Depending on the state, those STWs, they're as high as 17% of the overall workforce. And the shortfall of those limits economic productivity across the country, and particularly not only in industry, but also in government. And this is a place where community colleges and technical schools are really key to building and expanding this workforce. Putting it all together, only with a robust and concerted effort to develop our domestic talent and to welcome foreign-born talent alongside leadership in basic research and investment in critical and emerging technologies, can we ensure the U.S. remains what we all want it to be, a global science and engineering discovery powerhouse. I'll end with a version of what Arthi said referring to President Biden's speech. This country was built on dreams, big, bright, powerful dreams, and commitment and action to turn those dreams into a reality. We have to continue to dream big, not to accept less, but to imagine more and act collaboratively and together to secure that future, not just for ourselves, but for our children and our children's children. So what I've shared today is just a small sampling of the incredible wealth of data uh, that's available in the full indicators report. I encourage you to go look at the online suite uh, and, and mine that for additional data. The NCSES staff uh, and the board stand ready to help anyone who's interested in understanding that data or looking at different correlations than the ones that we presented in the default reports. And with that, I uh, is you were there. Great. I'll turn the, the floor to Debbie, Director of OMB, uh, uh, Nani Coloretti. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for coming today. We, uh, I, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, the FY25 President's Budget, which um, built on some of the themes that you may have heard in the State of the Union last week. Um, but I also know that um, there's a disappointing FY24 set of things happening, so I'm not, we're not blind to that, but I do want to highlight for you the President's commitment to research and development a little bit um, so you can understand our, our views on this and what we're, what we're stepping forward with um, and what we stepped forward with this week. Um, so anyway, thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about the overall themes of the budget, and then I'll go a little bit into the research development budget. So last week, as you know, the President, in his State of the Union, offered his vision for how we can build on the economic progress that we've made over the past three years. And that progress can be seen in the data, the macroeconomic data, 15 million jobs created, unemployment below 4% for the last two years, increasing wages as inflation falls, so real wages are up, and the investment we are seeing uh, because of bills that we've passed and that we're building on in communities across the country. So the President has made clear that this progress is really only the beginning, and he explained how we can continue to build our economy from the middle out and the bottom up. 
So the budget re released um, a couple days ago is consistent with that vision and those values. So first of all, the budget continues the administration's work of lowering costs for families. And so it includes co uh, proposals to lower drug costs, lower costs for childcare, increase affordable housing supply, expand access to health care, and also important to this uh, work, lower costs for higher education and lift the burden of student debt. Second, the budget invests in America and the American people. So it grows, it's continuing to grow the economy. It invests in all of America by supporting America's workforce, boosting manufacturing, providing national paid leave, advancing cancer research, making our communities safer, and confronting the climate crisis while spurring clean energy innovation. Third, the budget reduces the deficit by about $3 trillion by making our tax code fairer. So it reproposes policies that we've proposed before, uh, such as requiring billionaires to pay at least 25% of their income in taxes and raising the corporate tax rate to 28%. But it also includes new proposals, including raising the minimum tax rate on billion dollar corporations to 21%. And fourth, the budget strengthens and protects Social Security and Medicare. So the budget honors the president's commitment to reject efforts to cut both programs and embraces reforms that would protect and strengthen these programs, including by extending the solvency of the Medicare trust fund indefinitely. So let's talk a little bit about the um, uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act caps and some of the constraints, and I'll just touch on this really quickly. So this is our first budget, the FY25 president's budget that we put before uh, put forward under these caps, and Congress also had to work under those caps for the FY25 appropriation. So um, it, they are tight, um, and they feel like a cut <laughs> in, in reality. So that is the reality um, that we put ourselves in under in order to release, uh, lift up the debt ceiling, if you recall, uh, last summer. So while the FY25 president's budget reflects some of the tough choices that we had to make to keep within those caps, um, the budget actually pr protects a lot of the progress we've made and the gains we've made over the course of this administration, not only through the landmark legislation already signed, but sizable increases in discretionary investments for key priority areas. So I'll talk a little bit about research and development in the FY25 budget. That is definitely a key priority area for this president. So the budget includes $202 billion for research and development to tackle the greatest challenges of our time, including promoting health, addressing the climate crisis, and realizing the benefits of artificial intelligence, AI, while managing its risks. So the budget continues to support the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, which has an ambitious goal, as you know, of cutting the death rate from cancer by at least half over the next 25 years. Um, there's more than $3.4 billion in research and development uh, proposed for moonshot-related investment that supports laboratory, clinical, public health, and environmental health research programs across more than a dozen agencies. The budget also tackles climate crisis and the environmental impacts of, cl the climate, of climate change by supporting over $10.7 billion in clean energy innovation. These are activities that are crucial for the nation to achieve President Biden's goal to re uh, reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And the budget also supports $4.5 billion in climate research activities, including efforts that advance the U.S. Global Change Research Program's Decadal Strategic Plan. Decadal Strategic Plan. So the budget advances, additionally, advances safe, secure, trustworthy AI by investing in AI research and development. So that includes $1.6 billion in investments across the National Institutes of Health and $729 million for AI research and development at the National Science Foundation, including $30 million for the second year of the National AI Research Resource Pilot. And then finally, it includes $310 million for DARPA's AI Forward Initiative to research and develop trustworthy, reliable, timely, and ethical technology. This budget also prioritizes future economic competitiveness, which is the theme, some of the themes that are emerging in the report that you just got today. So supporting American innovation and leadership in research and scientific dis discovery by investing $20.1 billion in the three CHIPS and Science Act authorized agencies, 
the NSF, the Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, call it, and Department of Energy's Office of Science. So the budget calls for $900 million for NSF's Directorate for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships to build partnerships across research and development sectors and translate basic research into products and processes that can benefit the American people. And it calls for $606 million at the Department of Energy's Office of Science to integrate supercomputing, AI, and quantum-based technology for the next generation of high-performance computing systems in the US. Pivoting a little bit just to international needs, the budget includes $92.8 billion for Department of Defense research and development. And this funding will go to critical energy technology areas such as AI and autonomy, quantum information science, hypersonic system development, and advanced microelectronics, just to name a few. The budget also provides the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, we call it NNSA, <laughs> with $35 million to advance the space monitoring and verification program, and that will advance our space-based sensing capability. And then finally, the budget supports efforts, some of which were talked about today, uh, that expand equitable inclusion in federal science and technology programs. So supporting workforce development in STEM across America with an emphasis on emerging research institutions and historically underserved communities. And this includes investment in NSF's programs to broaden participation of historically underrepresented groups in STEM and the Department of Energy's proposal to build capacity for advancing energy research at historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, minority serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, community colleges, and emerging research institutions. So I'm personally excited about the president's budget and its strategic investments in science and technology, investments that we know will benefit everyone. And just wanted to come here and tell you about it a little bit and just you should know that R&D is a key priority for this administration and our budget works to protect the progress that we've made. So thanks, thank you for having me today. And I think Ponch is next, okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nani. I really appreciate uh, all the efforts on behalf of OMB, working with Director Young and you and our PAD, uh, Laura Haynes, has truly been a pleasure. So I want to thank you, first of all. Thanks to Director Prabhakar for assembling this uh, group together. Uh, uh, Director Prabhakar, Arti, I will, I will be remiss if I didn't tell you, thank you for all your efforts to advance science, technology, innovation all across our nation and doing this every day and working with all of us, so thank you. I want to thank Chair Reed. Uh, who I have the pleasure of working very closely and with all members of the National Science Board. And uh, I'm, I'm part of the board, but I also used to be a member of the board. So it's truly a distinct pleasure to work with every one of you. I know how hard uh, you've all worked in terms of turning out this amazing document, the indicators report. This is submitted every two years. And uh, you know, it's really, and Chair Kondik is here, and the Science Engineering Policy Committee, which I used to be a part of, uh, I know how, how hard they work. It's already right, we are already talking about the next uh, you know, indicators report already. You can see how long it takes to gather this up. So we owe a, uh, a debt of gratitude for all the great work that comes. And that's because Dr. Uh, Dr. Emelda Rivers of the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. Emelda, you, do, you and your team do an amazing job. We are so proud to have you at NSF and at NCs. And so thank you very much for all that you do. So I thought I should first express my gratitude. That's the most important thing. Next, I want to talk about, yes, uh, you know, it has been a disappointing FY24 budget for NSF. Right? But I will only reflect on that in the following way. You know, this is a, as was identified by the previous speakers, this is a moment that we need to supercharge, expand its scale, and move with speed. And so the budget of 24, the only way I would say it is, in a sense, is a missed opportunity to be able to scale and speed. Okay? That's the, that's the impact. It's real impact on the research enterprise. Having said that, I want, I'm always an optimist, everybody knows that. I look at the FY25 budget of the president and we are excited. We are excited by the fact that as, as Nani mentioned, the investments that is being made on the key priorities, and to me, there are two important priorities that we need to advance, which is how do we unleash talent all across our nation, in all parts of our nation. The domestic talent that was mentioned 
is augmentative, in other words, the global talent is additive to the domestic talent. We have to unleash both the domestic talent and global talent at speed and scale. So that provides for that kind of an approach of unleashing talent. The second is innovation can be anywhere and must be everywhere. And how do we unleash innovation all across our nation? And so again, that uh, you mentioned TIP in particular, but it's not only limited to TIP, but all the directorates of NSF contribute to this unbelievable scaling and speeding up of innovation all across our nation. These are two important things that we need to do uh, right now, the time is now. And so we're really excited at NSF. When I look at the FY25 budget, and I look at the amazing kind of investments that is being made on these thematic topics, we want to make sure that we are further strengthening the foundation, the core, the basic research and the foundational research of NSF, and we are doubling down on that and making sure that we are doing that. That's one theme. The next theme is how do we make sure that we are creating opportunities everywhere? I said the missing millions, how do we unleash the talent everywhere? So we're investing significantly on that. And I'm very proud to say that through our granted program recently, we are not only focused on a certain class of institutions, but we're expanding those investments to institutions, the minority serving institutions, community colleges, as well as in emerging research institutions. So there is a significant focus on those investments in terms of unleashing talent. The third focus area, which is how do we have the emerging industries for national and economic security, that the investments that we're making, again, in all the directorates and TIP ensures that we're able to unleash these new industries, the industries of the future, as well as strengthening the existing industries that we work every day. And I'm so proud that NSF has increased the partnership with industries quite significantly in the last couple of years. It is not just about partnering only in terms of making sure that we are working with them, but actually co-investments by industry in every sphere, in every program you will find has really scaled quite a bit, and I'm very happy about that. The next theme is research infrastructure. Nani talked about the NAIR, which is an exceedingly important moment. We have put in $30 million this year. Guess what? In 90 days uh, President, after President Biden issued the executive order with NSF being tasked to launch the NAIR pilot, I'm proud to say that we have 25 non-governmental partners as well as 12 federal agencies all coming together. NVIDIA investing almost close to $30 million, you know, uh, Microsoft $20 million, Amazon $10 million, a host of uh, you know, companies, the who's who in AI investing in this. That is the mode of how NSF is working, in partnership so that we can scale and speed up the thing that I talked about. So the research infrastructure is a sig significant team. And finally, we are also making sure that as we talk about the regional innovation engines that have been launched, you have all, you're all watching this in terms of um, all across the nation, the regional innovation being spurned and grown, and TIP has done a great job in terms of unleashing this very, very rapidly. And uh, Director Prabhakar and I had the opportunity of being in Reno, Nevada, and we saw firsthand how the lithium mining, extraction, processing, and the full life cycle of recycling, all being brought together by entire community coming together and participating in that is truly extraordinary to watch that. Likewise, in terms of the 10 large-scale regional innovation engines, I had the uh, fortune of being with uh, First Lady Dr. Biden in North Carolina and to watch the amazing regenerative medicine center with 82 partners. These 10 RIEs have brought 477 partners. And I'm so excited about, as you cannot hear in my voice, I apologize for that, but I just want to let you know that, you know, NSF is on a trajectory and working with uh, OSTP, working with the board, working with the OMB, working with the administration, and I again express my gratitude to President Biden and the Biden-Harris administration, and I look forward to working with Congress, and the bipartisan support that we have in Congress is very palpable. They are all committed to seeing how we can advance science, technology, and innovation for the benefit of the nation, so I look forward to working with our congressional colleagues on both sides of the aisle who are, who are truly supportive and seeing how we can take some of these you know, investments that are authorization in chips and science and make them appropriations and realize the budgets that have been proposed by the president in FY25. Thank you all for the opportunity of making a few remarks here, and uh, I look forward to working with all of you. Well, thank you. Now, I am optimistic, and I am going to try to have a lo lo louder voice for this, this question-answer session that is to follow. 
So uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, the, the speakers to come to the chairs. And um, I have you know, several colleagues who will have um, microphones to bring to you. And um, let's see. Let's do this quest, uh, question. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand, and I will call on you, and we will have a, a, a question and answer session. Anyone? Yes. And while we wait, I'm, I'm very happy to say I was doing the math, and I have been a user of indicators since 1993. So it's a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. So I'm Tracy Camp. I'm the CEO of the Computing Research uh, Association. And I wanted to talk about the number of PhD degrees that are being awarded uh, to domestic students. So in computing, the number of PhD degrees that have been awarded has not changed much over time, but the percent of PhD degrees awarded in computing uh, to domestic students has decreased uh, pretty substantially over the last uh, 10, 12 years. Uh, today, only about 60% or 40% of PhD degrees in computing are uh, going to domestic students. So um, basically, we are not retaining our best and brightest into doctoral programs in the United States uh, for computing. And this is uh, true, I know, in some other STEM fields as well. So um, CRA, Computing Research Association, we're very interested in trying to help solve this problem. Uh, we would love to see uh, PhD fellowships for juniors, our best and brightest juniors, uh, to retain them into p uh, graduate programs, uh, a path to give them a path towards graduate programs before industry descends uh, their senior year. Um, and I was just wondering if this is a way to unleash the talent, uh, the domestic talent that uh, Ponch mentioned, is this a path forward for the U.S.? Is to think about, uh, you know, think about juniors and fellowships for juniors into PhD programs. Sure, um, I think this is a very, very good point. I think more you, you'll notice that the research. I, I'm, I'm speaking from my personal experiences, uh, research experiences for undergraduates, and ensuring that we have more of the students, domestic students being motivated to take, take on research is an investment is really very, very well worth made. So the, the, modus, the modus operandi of how, whether it is through a fellowship or whether it is through the research, the REU programs of investment, I think it also behooves the academic uh, faculty members to make sure that they are engaging with the undergraduate students. I used to have a number of them in my own research center and many of them did go to, to, to do PhD and, and achieve great things. So in this day and age, it's very important to do a couple of things. One is, how do we ensure that? The second thing is, how do we make sure that these fellowships at the graduate level are competitive? And so that when they are contrasting it against what it takes for them to go give up the industry job and having to pursue PhD with their passion for doing a PhD, that we are doing enough in terms of ensuring that those stipends are at a, at a higher level. At NSF, as you know, in the last few years, we have raised the stipend from 34,000 to 37,000 for our graduate research fellowship program. We have also increased the education supplements that we are providing so that we are showing that we are really serious about ensuring that people are not staying away because of these challenges. But that's not enough. That's not enough. We need to do a lot more. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that in partnership with the industry, because you know, this, is a, this is a joint problem. Industry is also benefiting from these PhD doctoral candidates that come out of academia, as well as academia, of course. And so what we might do with the industry in terms of fellowships that are with industry is something that NSF will be exploring more into the future. So full disclosure, of course, he and I are both computer scientists. So this is a topic personally near and dear to our hearts. I agree with everything Pot said. I think setting the hook early with research experiences and getting that sense of excitement uh, is really an important part of pe leading people on down the life of the mind. I agree about uh, industry partnerships and feeding that pipeline because, let's be honest, in many cases, the most important thing that universities produce, beyond ideas, new ideas, is the talent pipeline that feeds industry. And 
that's a critical piece of continuing to accelerate uh, industry growth. I think there are opportunities to address some of those issues uh, with blended programs that get at exactly what you said at the undergraduate level. But I will say honestly, if, uh, if you look at our graduate research fellowship program at NSF and the percentage of students we fund relative to the number of students that are highly meritorious, we're leaving a lot of talent behind. If we had more resources there, we could put more money into creating adequate stipends, and you alluded to that, that is also an issue that our best and brightest, when they see this economic disparity between six, eight, ten years of graduate education and income lost versus the opportunities in industry, if that skews too much, yeah, the money does matter, and we have to be realistic about building some different kind of partnerships to address that. So I completely agree. Thank you. Next, Miriam. Hi, Miriam Quintal, Lewis Burke Associates, also one of the co-chairs of the Coalition for National Science Funding. Thank you all so much for your remarks today. Um, back in 2018, the board put out, just after the science and indicators uh, came out, uh, science and engineering indicators came out that year, a resolution that we expected China to surpass the U.S. at the end of 2018 uh, in global, uh, in, in domestic R&D uh, expenditures. And I was just wondering if you all could comment on the good news we see in this report that China did not surpass us in 2018, and they have not surpassed us uh, now to, through till 2021. And w what do we think changed in our, you know, that we weren't expecting back in 2018? And what did we successfully do that we need to continue to do, especially as we face once again, that we faced in that era of constrained budgets, and how can we, avo how can we avoid so we don't, don't set ourselves on a bad course again? I think that's a really interesting observation because I think we've all been waiting to see wh when those, those two curves cross, and they haven't crossed. So I think it's worth peeling that. A couple of things happened. Now, one thing that's critically important is that our total uh, investment in R&D in, in America has continued to just uh, grow faster than GDP. It's, it's even more intense than the GDP growth. That is driven by our industry spending in R&D. And it, again, I think it really reflects everything from um, a, a macroeconomic environment that causes companies to feel bullish about the future, but also the fact that there are enormous opportunities coming from science and technology, including publicly funded science and technology, that they see can, they can turn into revenues and profits. So th that, that has been the fundamental huge driver. Federal R&D has more or less stayed level as a percentage of GDP. With, you know, it ebbs and flows with geopolitics and budgets and everything else. But the, the big story in terms of the growth in, 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 and the intensification with the growth as a percentage of GDP, that's all industry. So number one, we, we, that's great for the country. It, it brings its own issues. Um, but we want to make sure that the industry is able to continue um, to, to, to see that optimism, see those opportunities. And that includes making sure that that federal foundation is solid. That's very much how I think about the, the US piece of it. I think it's worth noting that uh, China and the, and the PRC are also struggling, I think, with some of their own economic issues. And so, you know, I think I, long history tells us that simple extrapolations of curves is not really the way the world unfolds. And I think it's still to be told. The, the final thing I'll just say on this is we've spent uh, this conversation and many more all focus on the U.S. and China. One thing I think is quite notable is that the next um, most uh, significant spending on R&D is the EU altogether. And that is, uh, that China's spending on R&D in 2021 is about 40% greater than all of Europe put together. And I think it really speaks to the fact that um, we're not alone anymore. We have a very significant R&D competitor uh, in China, uh, and, but that actually there's a big gap between there and where the rest of the world is. And I think that also uh, tells us a lot about what, uh, what our challenges are ahead. I'd add, I agree with all of that. I'd add one other thing to think about. And obviously China has, has some economic issues of its own right now that uh, are challenges. The other thing that we don't often think about is why do people want to come to the U.S.? 
And as I said, that's not a birthright. We have to keep investing every day to create that environment where we're a magnet for talent. Because we don't want a level playing field. We'll lose just on the statistics of pop global population if it's level. We want it tilted in our favor. And the way they do, we do that is create an environment where you have more opportunities. Right? The talent wants to come here, and that speaks to access to research infrastructure. It speaks to the quality of people you can collaborate. But it also speaks to the, and this is the point I really wanted to make, to the openness of the research environment. Uh, and the fact that you can pursue ideas freely uh, is really important, uh, and that there was less barrier to translate those ideas into practice. Uh, people look for opportunities, right? They always do. And the smarter the people are, the more discri discriminate, discriminating they are about what those opportunities are. So I think that's another thing that has contributed to it. And the fact that we've seen a rebound in the number of students studying in the U.S. I think is, a, is another indicator of that. Thank you. Next. Uh, oh, yes. Um, my name is Lisa Cooley. I'm the director of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, and I'm here representing Ellen Stofan on behalf of the Smithsonian. Um, I was delighted to hear about the vision for the NSF and the NSB to do conduct research at scale and fast. Uh, in terms of astrophysics, we are falling behind from the rest of the world, and we, like other, many other fields, we require large-scale infrastructure. And in particular, the European Southern Observatory, which is a consortium of 16 countries is currently building uh, an extremely large telescope in Chile and it's going to be done in five years, just five years. Chile now have, uh, there's now a site in Chile that's owned by China and they can also build things fast and at scale. So we're really happy to see and um, delighted that the NSB has recommended um, a single US extremely large telescope to be built. And so uh, the question I have is, is given the need to, to build and to conduct research at scale and fast, what mechanisms or what new processes does the NSF have in place and in order to build infrastructure fast and also to be able to attain the federal government uh, uh, funding required to build infrastructure fast like these other countries are able to do at the moment? No, uh, uh, thank you for asking that question. We are constantly at NSF thinking about what is the infrastructure that is needed to be keeping us in the vanguard of scientific discovery and exploration. This is a constant pursuit. It's not a one-time thing or a one particular infrastructure. It's every directorate, uh, you, may, you, you may be familiar, every directorate has an advisory board, and they come up with recommendations from the scientific community as well as the decadal surveys, like the Astro 2020 and others, give us insights in terms of the key priorities that we need to, we need to prioritize. We work, of course, with the National Science Board as we think through how these things are then relatively prioritized within the agency as well as what makes sense for the scientific community. So, uh, and you alluded to the last point that you made about the funding required for all of this. So that's a key component as we think about this because there are competing priorities that are there and there's a lot more on the plate than uh, you know, uh, conceivably funding for. And that's where what, you know, I don't look at this as ne necessarily a, you know, either or. What, what we're trying to do in this regard is start to look at how might partnerships be a mechanism of scaling. You talked about scaling, you're talking about speeding up. So it is not all about whether you have the funding all in store in order to be able to launch something, right? And this has been a methodology that has been used even in the past. I'm not saying it is new. But we are trying to increase the scale of the partnership and the size of the partnerships to find where we can find common interest that brings us together, even within our own nation in terms of interagency partnerships, where appropriate philanthropy and, and industry partnerships to see how we can advance on these things. Because it is in our collective interest. And when, 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 when you're celebrating today that is 3.5% of the GDP, clearly the significant investments that industry is making, how might we you know, bring those uh, partners who are investing heavily in research to see how they might see the importance of infrastructure, they may see the importance, importance of, to the previous point about talent, and partnering on those fronts so that we can advance with speed. So this is going to be a constant pursuit. If I can give you some glimmer of hope is the data point that I presented to you with Nair. There is that desire to want to partner. There is a desire to co-create, co-produce, and you know, work on things that we find is of common interest. So that's a good sign. 
it need that it still need a lot more work needs to be done to advance it at the scales that we are talking about for the kind of infrastructure that we are referencing here i'll just add one thing and, I, and i'm sure it looks okay um the board and and Poch and the, and the leadership of nsf have been talking about this issue at length you know and for quite a long time there's sort of been one major instrument in the pipeline at a time there's a growing need for an increasing number of larger instruments, and we know that the price tag on large-scale instrumentation continues to rise. At the limit, we get one per planet, right? And it sort of goes down. Uh, you get multiplicity as the costs go down. And so that speaks to the global collaboration. But mechanisms to do early prioritization and analysis uh, it's so that there can be early feedback and, and changes in scope or plans as opposed to these go-no dis decisions very late in the process after much time has been invested. That's, we're, we're working hard to try to think through the best ways to do that. I was going to key off of the topic of infrastructure more broadly because infrastructure and facilities I think are such a key thing. I'm looking at the people in this room and the voices that you have to explain how important science and technology is and why it changes Americans' lives I think is vital to the support that exists across on this end of Pennsylvania Avenue and on both sides of the aisle on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I just would ask um, that you continue. I know there's been a good focus put on facilities and infrastructure, but I think we all need to recognize that that is the stuff that you take for granted until you don't have it, and then we've got a real problem. So I just, I think that has to continue to be part of the conversation. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today here at the White House to talk about the future of American research and development. Thank you to our speakers for joining us today. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining. And we have weekend reading to do. To do. Uh, so thank you again to the board and NCSES for providing us once again uh, data and volumes that we will use and use all over again, at least for the next two years. And then we'll have the next edition. So. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you very much. Goodbye, and uh, and well, we'll have a have a great week.